So today's topic actually is systems. So this far we have had the uh, signals part, which is basically how to make these fundamental signal sequences and how to save those for the future further use, how to calculate the signal to noise ratio and simulate a certain amount of noise at the top of a signal. Okay, important parts. Uh, the next part actually will be about system properties or fundamental system properties. And uh, okay, let me open this slide show. Some fundamental stuff. Uh, about the basic digital signal processing operations. There are not so many. Those are the mostly used operations. Uh, one is the uh, uh, summing junction, meaning add operation. There are not too many. That, that's basically, say, 90% of the uh, systems can, can be described by just these four operations. Uh, bigger systems, if, if they are linear, then it can be breaking down into these parts. And actually, this is not used that much. Well, telecommunications, yes. This is the, a one fundamental operation on telecommunication, multiplying of signals, meaning that, for example, AM modulation. You have the signal, and then you modulate it with a high-frequency high sinusoid. That, that's used there. But basically, these are enough to describe any linear time invariant system. Add operation. Scale meaning multiply a scalar. The same as uh, basically gain. It's same same as gain, uh, a, uh, the, the, the constant gain for the signal. And then delay. Or actually, there's also another advanced operation, but it's, it's more or less like a uh, uh, something for to simplify equations. But but yes, a time delay. Okay, let me go a little bit. Explain a little bit here. So add operation, basically, you have two signals, x1, x2, both are discrete time signals, and they go into a summing junction. Uh, if you have, basically, uh, uh, addition of more than three signals, then you can add more inputs, but it doesn't make any sense in at the uh, the, the, the end of the day, you will be doing addition of two numbers in any case. In processor level, that adds only two numbers together. But you can, of course, cascade these and put more, more elements to be added. Third signal. Okay, that's the add. And then basically that... Uh, Okay, A. If you have a just multiply a, by a scalar meaning gain, then basically the output is just a scalar times that signal. There you have the sum of those signals. Delay. It's just like a uh, uh, memory operation. Basically, if you have any signal going into signal delay, it's just a, um, like D-latch, D-latch, uh, which uh, saves the previous value. Okay, so one time step delay would be just 1D, or basically if you have a power to N here, then you have capital N. So how many time steps delay? And this operation basically on computer language would mean just uh, st 
restoring the current value to a temporary memory and basically use the previous value which was stored. Okay, good. And this is just simple multiplication. This is just simple addition. Those are the common blocks. So this is just linear processing is easy when you break it down into small pieces. Nothing fancy about it. Okay. However, saying that it's easy, there are some concepts that you should be aware of. Fundamental properties of systems. Um, any digital system, those four properties are kind of uh, uh, basically gives you information if you can treat the system in certain way. They are not like good or bad. This is not yin and yin here. It's it's just the uh, uh, property. There are plenty of non-linear systems which are good. Okay. If a system is linear, it's, it just means it's easier to handle. Uh, other means uh, linearity means for the system point of view that you can actually um, break down this sum into pieces. Uh, okay, uh, I need to explain a little bit here again. Break down meaning. Linear system, if you have system F. Okay, F and you have basically a scale A signal before it goes through the system. That's actually A times. Okay, oh, no, 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 no. That actually, if the system is linear, then you can move that's equal to the system where you have the x of n first goes through the system and then you have the gain afterwards. So basically, if, if, you, the, uh, if you can change this uh, order of operations then system is, I think, is commutative or something like that. It, it's, it's, it, it's one of these mathematical concepts, but part, one part of the oh, one part of the linearity. Another part is that okay, if you have two sing, two different signals and have a sum of that one. Let's take x1, the summing junction with x2, run it through the system. This would be exactly the same as running the signals through two similar systems. and add the outputs. If those are the same, basically both this and that, then the system is linear. That actually helps you on uh, designing systems and also breaking down systems. You can break down actually loops using this one because if a subsystem is linear, then you can more the summing junctions on either of those ways. And it also it's a nice property since if a system is linear, you need to actually have one response, one known response, for example, impulse response, to know exactly what happens on the system. But only if the system is linear. Only if it's a linear system. Uh, examples of a system which are not linear is any saturating system. 
meaning that if a um, okay one good example you have a really nice Toyota <laughs> car and you put up the biggest loudspeakers you can find from the market and the biggest amplifier on the market. You turn on the volume to not to point 10 but to 11 and start listening some nice music like boom, boom, boom. You know, you know those. <laughs> Would it help to put more amplifiers into it? You know, before the big system or after the system? Would, it, would the, uh, the result would be the same if you override the uh, back-end amplifier with a pre-amplifier? Okay. As long as you are not overriding, it does not make any sense which way the amplifiers, if you turn up a volume on the pre-amplifier or on the uh, front amplifier. They, 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 they would be exactly the same result. But if you uh, ramp the, the input of the uh, post, the, the, this, this uh, uh, what is that, power amplifier with too much gain on the pre-amplifier, you get distortion. And that's not the same result. It sounds much better to have distortion, right? <laughs> but anyways, the, um, it's not linear. Saturating systems are not linear. Okay. Um, and there are also some other other examples there. All uh, right. Then causality, not casuality. Casuality is like with t-shirt and jeans. Causality is about cause. There. And it basically says there is no effect before action. So nothing happens unless there will be some change in input. That's a good property, actually. Well, it's a property. It's not good, but usually it's uh, considered good to have some sort of glue how the system is behaving. remember something I need to hmm. I need to pull this one on charger sorry about that there mm-hmm Okay, so causality. Causal system means that there must be a reason for the reaction. Human beings are not causal. They make plans for for the future. So basically, this would be also the uh, the causal system is a reactive system, meaning that it first happens and then there is a reaction. But for example, if I would be going to punch this guy here, he would he would probably go like this, like right, and then there'll be a re reaction, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's not, not try that one. <laughs> I know what ha would happen then. <laughs> so causal means that basically he would be, you know, would be eyes closed and then I would be punching him. So no way of reacting before something already happens. Okay. <laughs> So what, what it actually means that in signal sense, if you have the input for the system starting at point zero, for example, any input, it can be, for example, like that. It could be 
also something else. Then that sys signal goes to the system and comes out. System is causal if there is absolutely nothing here. So all of those are zeros and the system starts reacting only after the uh, signal comes. At the same moment that the signal starts or later, then the system is causal. If there's any non-zero values on the time before this uh, input happens, then the system is not causal anymore. Stability. Ah. Okay. Uh, have you covered the stability of, uh, say, on in electronics, in analog electronics? Pro maybe, maybe not. That was about on S plane, having the poles uh, poles on the wrong side of the S plane. You have in oscillations. Okay, but anyways, that that's actually a little bit related to this topic. Stable. Stable. And the property is actually stability. Stable system means that if you have a system here, any system, again, and you have input bounds, boundary. So this is the maximum of x. This is minimum of x. Then basically, if a system is stable, then you know that the output is also bounded. So this is bounded input. Uh, would lead to bounded output. Maximum of y, minimum of y. These boundaries, they don't. It doesn't make any difference what what the exact numbers are. But if you can find the boundaries for the output for any bounded input, then the system is stable. Okay, makes sense. Meaning, hmm. What does it actually mean? Yeah, it's actually nice. Uh, systems which are not stable are chaotically oscillating systems which saturate. Saturation is usually not a good property unless you are playing lead guitar on heavy metal band. <laughs> All right. How many of you are playing? Uh, are you playing heavy metal? No. Uh, uh, we just still could play heavy metal you know, <laughs> with acoustic. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, sure. You are not a young radical then. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So stable stable systems actually or if if you are planning a or making any kind of filter then it, they just have to be stable. Uh they they are actually also uh some rules when the system is stable or well unstable generally leads into not on numbers when you are uh, implementing those on computer on a processor level. It gives you, at the, some, some point, it starts giving not a number as a result, meaning no output. Uh, there's also the critically stable system, which means that it starts on the edge, which means that you can make quite easily oscillators with a digital signal processing. You do not need to calculate the sinusoid. If you have a certain good delay uh, feedback 
and certain uh, the, the, the parameters correctly, then you can actually calculate the sinusoids without touching any sinusoid actually at all. It's uh, self oscillating, self oscillating the uh, circuit. Okay, and then we have this time shift invariance. In variance. No, oh, meaning actually that the system behavior does not change. Meaning that if you have a uh, input with some delay, basically would lead into output with the same delay, and that would be actually oh, okay same as the output for the delay signal. So basically, uh, it means that, okay, another way around would mean that if you have delay before the output, that will be exactly the same as having the uh, Output first and then delay. Yep. Okay. Most of the systems usually are. But there are actually also some systems that, that definitely are not, and they are designed that way. Like parking meters. When you park a car, well, in Japan you don't. You cannot afford to have a car for the next 20 years, right? <laughs> At least not park it in Tokyo. <laughs> um, but basically, parking meters, usually the parking zones are such that it's more expensive to park a car during, during the business hours than during the night. Okay, it means that the system changes behavior on uh, 6 a.m. and 7 p.m. or something like that. So it means that kind of systems are not time shift invariant. But say a vending machine, you want to have a time shift invariant system. So every time you put a coin there, whatever time it is, it always brings you this nice bottle of soda or something like that. Yeah. So again, this is some 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 design parameters too. Uh, take into consideration. Um, this course is dealing mostly with systems which are linear and time shift invariant. All right. Did I take? Let's see. So. One term to remember, linear and time shift invariant equals to LTI system. And this course is about the LTI systems, linear and time shift invariant. We have some exercises actually about the linearity and uh, what's it causality there? Maybe stability will be coming later. Maybe time shift invariance. Maybe I don't remember. I changed those actually a little bit. Okay, let's go further. So for linear time shift invariant systems, we can always describe with this kind of. Uh, the uh, difference equation, and let's go back a little bit. Okay, there. These three operations, add, scale, delay. Add, scale, delay.
There's a difference equation which consists of add scale delay those three operations uh, let me draw this is the bad thing about the uh, well I'm using the Google slides and uh, basically if I use the Google equations equations for the or down equations the editor then this would do not necessarily show up <laughs> uh, that's why I have this uh, mathematic is not the, the mathematic markings are not perfect on the my document sorry about that in any case the difference equation for LTI system it always looks like this there's a sum with index k from 0 to n this scaling parameter a k so this is a vector n, uh, n plus 1 uh, number of uh, the, the uh, constants times y of n minus k that equals to uh, I need more room uh, k from 0 to n b k times x n minus k so that actually is the uh, input and history that one here is the output and history a history is made by the delays these are the scaling factors for each of the uh, these terms and this is thus a summation so the um, flow diagram for any linear time invariant system looks like this input and there's the output The system will be here so it's one or uh, single input single output system SISO S -I -S -S -O. okay and everything of that what system does happens in between uh, within that uh, red box and basically here you would have x of n let's make a delay a chain so here we have one time step delay another another and so on so at this point you have x n minus 1 x n minus 2 x n minus 3 and so on uh, actually let's do the same thing for the output since we also need the output and the history we are using part of the uh, previous output values and feed those back into the uh, equation so delay 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 and so on so this is y n minus 1 here y n minus 2 y n minus 3 so this is the previous value uh, value before that one value before that one for output the same thing for input so basically the, uh, the system itself must have some local memory to store the previous values uh, C programming language. Are you familiar with C programming language? 
okay? Functions in C programming language. language. If you have a function, uh, for example, a function that returns you double values, uh, func, good name, and say, has one input variable, name x, okay? Local memory function, uh, remember there was one special kind of uh, variable, uh, actually the same. Called static. Right, remember the static. Static double x means that this actually uh, will be remaining, uh, or, or it will be saving the previous values. You can save the previous values in the static memory. If you don't make it like this, uh, it, there's absolutely no guarantee that the variables uh, inside a function would change in between the co-function calls. But this way, you, you can actually make sure that you have the previous values there, or a table of previous values. Okay, so, yeah, so we have the um, x of n and the deal input histories right here, output, output histories right here. Okay, let me mark a little bit of the flow, since it flows the other way around here. All right, then we have the, um, okay, the, these are the scaling uh, uh, parameters. So x of n is multiplied by b0. x n minus 1 is multiplied by b1 and so on. So we have b0, b1, b2, b3. So basically we have the same index here as we have the delay on our equation. Same for the uh, y of n. This is a1, so the same index value. a2, a3. Now the question is, where is a0? a0 is right here. 1 times y of n. So a0 in, in this difference equation is always zero, uh, 1. OK, good. And then we basically just have this summing, summing chain right here. All right, and that's the flow diagram of any linear time invariant system. Does it make sense? Maybe. <laughs> Maybe at the end of the day. Good. So in principle, if you, if you knew how many parameters you have here, you could actually write your own function to calculate this flow diagram. Meaning you can do the implementation by uh, writing some C programming language code. Okay, so, yep, what, what's next? Example about a difference equation or four point running average uh, filter, meaning four subsequent points, only the input is used, there's no feedback. In this system, so that's actually, uh, I think I have also the uh, flow chart somewhere on the on this. Let's see. Yeah, flow chart or block diagram. So, so basically, this block diagram, this one is directly the same as this direct form uh, implementation. It does not have any feedback, so this one is not there. But otherwise, it has the one uh, 
quarter of input, one quarter of the previous value, one quarter of the one value before that one, and then this one. So this actually calculates the four point running average. Okay. Whatever the input is, it always gives the four point running average for from that. Okay. You can implement it like that. That's one way of doing it. Or you can also, since these blocks are, um, oh, by the way, yeah, I, I just noticed the marking here. Z minus 1 is same as D. Yeah, so the D actually is delay. Z minus 1 is uh, on the Z plane, it's same as delay. <laughs> so that can be also Z minus 1. Z to the power of minus 1. Okay, so these are linear blocks, so we can use the properties that you can actually take this one in front of everything. And okay, this is much cost efficient to calculate. The multiplications in, in any processor will take time compared to the addition. So basically, you have one multiplication uh, on the Okay, this could be also up here, but anyways, you can change that the place, but on the block diagram, you can also use it, but multiply just the input with one quarter and then just calculate the running sum. Or third, okay, this is recursively done uh, system meaning that you are using the previous value, you subtract the latest or the oldest uh, input value and add the current input value with the weight. Okay. So think of, say, that you have a 100 point running average. In this, you have 100 multiplications and 99 additions. In this one, you would have one multiplication and 99 additions. In this one, you would have one multiplication, two additions. Which one is the most cost efficient to do? That one. <laughs> okay, good. So basically, there's this block diagram or flow diagram or flow chart or whatever the name is. There are plenty of names for this this representation of the signal flow. Uh, this is the tool to design the implementation, meaning we have the uh, difference equation as you had here. We have three different difference equations. And basically, the block diagram level shows you which is the most cost-efficient way of calculating. At least for me, it's, it's, it's a, you probably can also see it from the equation, but it, this makes it more real what the system actually does. So optimizing the system behavior would happen on the block diagram level. And then it's easy to just make the, uh, well, your code. Good. Wow. <laughs> More stuff. We have this difference equation. Nice. Uh, did I take a picture? Yes, I did. Good. Uh, all right, that's for the implementation. We need to know how the system is calculated in time space. However, for any the uh, uh, frequency space analysis or design, we need to know about the 
transfer function. Transfer function actually describes the system in complex frequency domain. All right, we are not in a Kansas anymore. <laughs> ha, yeah. Who is the thin one? Uh, so, transfer function. This is more like, you know, the evil witch of these. So, con the, oh, for the continuous time, the, uh, lap the, the continuous time transfer functions are uh, defined as Laplace transforms. So, we, you have the uh, Laplace transform of output divided by Laplace transform of input gives you the uh, continuous time uh, frequency domain transfer function. In discrete time, we have different kind of transform. It's uh, the uh, Z transform. Um, I think most of you haven't heard of those transforms yet. Uh, nothing to worry about. It's quite simple. The Laplace transform actually can be a little bit com more complex because on the continuous time, this system uh, well, there have been a lot of lots of uh, mathematics done to make some uh, tables where you can compare the Laplace transforms to uh, finally come up with a system. But but on the discrete time, this is quite straightforward for linear time invariant system. Um, okay how to describe this one, what it does. I'll just give it as it is. <laughs> so, okay, difference equation is for time space, but then when you need the system uh, Calculate the system in frequency space. You need basically the, the uh, transfer functions, but it actually starts from the um, let's see the, the definition. Let's start it from there. So if we have a system with x of n as input, that's the system linear time invariant system, and we have the output. Then basically uh, just Think that we have that, that kind of operation like Z transform. If we take the Z transform, that's actually a linear operation, meaning that um, then basically we can take the Z transform of input and what comes out is the same as the Z transform of the output. Nothing fancy here yet except that actually the C transform of this, whatever happens here is called the system transfer function. Okay. Am I going somewhere with this one? Uh, the, the reason why we are doing this one uh, is because when you are handling the system with the uh, transfer function, our equation for the output is quite simply the transfer function of the system multiply the C transform of the input. So instead of analyzing this kind of time uh, based things with which are quite complicated to think of how, how, how the, the, this output actually is related to input. Uh, mathematically, on the um, Z plane, on the complex plane, all of that becomes just a simple multiplication. Simple multiplication. Okay. So that's why we are doing, meaning that, for example, if you want to make a filter, uh, this is already in frequency domain, 
you can first design the filter properties. What kind of filter properties you would like to have? And make basically the transfer function which has those frequency properties. Then you can do the same route back and uh, translate this one into the, the uh, difference equation and start calculating it. Okay, so in any case, think of a, for example, low pass filter with cutoff frequency somewhere here. Would like to have something like that. Nice low pass filter. How to design that one? You cannot do it in time space. Only way you can design it is in frequency space. And the question is now just how to basically find a proper uh, the uh, transfer function that gives this frequency response. And that's all that, that there is. Nothing more than that. Then you can do the rest and the code. Okay. Wow. Lots of good new stuff. Um, oops. Let me go one more. Oops. Transfer function. Okay, good, good. So we have a transfer function, H of Z, that de describes the whole system. Okay, and uh, yes, the filtering actually. This here is already filtering equation. This is same as uh, fundamentally, this is same as linear convolution, meaning the filtering operation on the uh, 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 frequency domain. Okay, when you go back to the, this uh, design chain, you can actually find out the system coefficients A and B that you will get the uh, filter to work. Okay, so, yeah. So design basically starts from here, filter design. First you uh, figure out what kind of frequency response you will desire. Then you use some method to define the uh, frequency uh, transfer function. And basically there do some magic to turn those parameters in the system coefficients A and B. So basically this here is defined by system coefficient vectors A and B. Okay. Good. And the filtering is just that one. When you have the system coefficients A and B found out that way. Yeah, now it makes a little bit of sense. <sighs> Um, do we need these? Yeah, actually we do. Good, I'll take a picture and then we'll continue. I'll continue on that page. So those, those are the important Z transform properties. that can be used in order to find the age of Z. Remember the age of Z now actually is Z transform of output defined by Z transform of input. Yes, because well, you get output by multiplying transfer function with the input. Good. Let's try to do Z-transform of our difference equation. Just, you know, take the Z-transform of left-hand side and right-hand side. Well, why can we do it? Well, because the Z-transform is linear, we can actually 
easily just do it. So, Z transform uh, the difference equation. Okay? We get uh, Z transform of Okay, that's sum a k y n minus k. I will just start calculating things since these are quite look like the same. So basically, well, should I? Well, maybe maybe I should actually just continue it like that. Sum of b k times x n minus k. So this far I have just taken the uh, z transform of both sides. And the equality remains because Z transform is linear. This one actually says that I can actually move Z transform inside, inside of the sum because the sum of inputs is the same as sum of outputs. Okay, meaning that this is still true that Okay, and then another thing, that there's a, a scaling. You can take the scaling out of the Z transform. So basically we have a k times Z transform of, of Y N minus K equals to sum of B K times Z Y N minus K. Wow. All right. Then we have some smart mathematicians have found out a time shift property of Z transform. So if we have a delayed input, then basically we can take that delay out as Z minus K. If you have a delay of K, meaning minus k here, that comes as a z to the exponential, and then multiplied by x, uh, the z transform of input. Oh, we are, we are actually getting quite close to this one already. So time shift property. A k times z to minus k times Z transform of Xn. Ha, common multiplier. So we can take this one actually outside of the uh, sum. Bk, no x. Ah, nobody says anything. That's actually y, the output. Times Z to minus k times Z. Ah, that's x x of n. All right, and we can take z to y, uh, z transform of output and z transform of input uh, outside of those equations, which means that we can now calculate this one here. Okay, if we move this one here and the other one, so we just basically divide it, divide that one off from the that side and divide this one off from the other side, we will get simple sum of b k times z to minus k divided by a k times z to minus k. This way, not the other way around. It's very simple to make mistake now. System coefficients for historical reasons, they have been always like these are actually the scaling uh, terms for input and A's have been always the scaling terms of output. Don't ask me why it's that way, but it, that's the way it is. <laughs> okay, so... No. That's the 
transfer function for any linear time invariant system, which now actually looks much nicer and neater than, than you know, this mathematical mumbo jumbo I used to have on, on this page. Okay, that's the transfer function that defines the system. And especially, let's take a closer look at system coefficients A and B. For linear time invariant system, we have exactly the same system coefficients both in time space and frequency space. That's nice. We don't need to do any big mathematics. As soon as we get the design from the uh, desired the um, frequency response for the system, from that one we get the transfer function in this form. We get this uh, system coefficients. We don't need to do anything in between. We can just start using them in the difference equation, meaning calculating the output for the given input. Wow. Yeah, that's the same in terms. Okay. Um, so, for example, four-point running average filter what is the transfer function for that one? This is B0, B1, B2, B3. What is A1? Yes, it's just, you know, one here. This can be never zero. Otherwise, you wouldn't have any transfer function. So the term for which multiplies the output current output multiply is always one. Okay, one. And other, uh, the, the uh, higher term uh, uh, product, uh, scalars actually are zero. But the, uh, there must be at least one output. Okay, so we have, a, we have basically, the transfer function is that one here. So we have B0, B1, B2, B3, and then we have the delay terms, uh, delay of uh, zero, okay, delay of one. So this is actually Z to power of zero, right. Uh, Z minus one, Z to minus two, Z to minus three. Okay, that's exactly the same coefficients as on the transfer function as we have on the uh, difference equation. Okay, and how about the feedback? We also have this uh, other type. Uh, let's go back a little bit. There's another way of describing the system right here. So let's see, we have the, uh, okay. Maybe I should um, write it somewhere. <laughs> Let's write it here. So we have uh, the difference equation is y of n. Okay, I will move this one on the left hand side. So minus y, n minus 1 equals one quarter times x of n minus one quarter of x of n minus four. Okay, there we have a zero is actually one. One times y n. Uh, a one equals minus one. So system coefficients for vector A is one minus one. Oh, let's put the mathematics, math, math parameters here. And then basically we have the, uh, 
that's B. Zero is one quarter. And then we have actually B4 is minus one quarter. Terms B1 to B3 are actually all zeros. When you describe that kind of vector, you have one quarter, zero, 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 one quarter. As a vector, since you must have also the zeros, so B1, B2, B3. Okay. So, actually, if you take this equation and multiply it by 1, meaning 1 minus z2 minus 1 divided by 1 minus z2 minus 1, so this is totally 1, okay, this one goes so, as a denominator. If you multiply these polynomials, you will get 1 plus z2, uh, 1 plus minus c2 minus 4. Oh, wow, there's a, a mistake here. So you have 1 minus c2 minus 4. Let me change that. <laughs> okay. I still have the mistake. I, I need to fix it. Fix it later. All right. So the feedback, even the feedback actually can be, uh, it just have the, the, the uh, well, fundamentally exactly the same Difference equals uh, the, the uh, transfer function, but it just have different forms of the difference equations. But it, it's still the same. Any system actually, the difference equations may vary, but they all, if the systems are same, it means that the transfer functions are the same. Good. Wow, more stuff. Let me take a couple of pictures again. Now let's forget the time space for a while. Concentrate a while for the uh, difference equation. <laughs> Transfer function. Oh boy. So let's concentrate on the transfer function. All right. Transfer function looks like this H of z equals 2. K from 1 to n, bk times z to minus k. And this is k from 1 to n, a k times z to minus k. Let me do, do first some magic. So negative polynomials, I don't like those. Those aren't actually, they don't look, look nice. I can actually do uh, such a thing that I will just multiply everything with uh, both numerator and denominator with c to n. I have done nothing wrong here. It's just, you know, I multiplied the whole to total thing by one. Okay, so basically that's the same as k from one zero to n b k times c to n minus k, and here we have k from zero to n a k times z to n minus k. How does this help us? Well, fundamentally, we have a polynomial that looks like this. Z, uh, B0 times z to n plus B1 times z to n minus 1, n minus 1 plus and so on until we get the last with this Bn times z to 0. Okay. In denominator... Same thing. Uh, the, okay, 
So we have a rational polynomial. So this is a polynomial of z that's also a polynomial of z. Nth degree polynomial. Fundamental high school math says that how many special point zeros we have for this kind of polynomial equation. Just mark it at zero. And those are the rules. Right. Remember. Do you? <laughs> okay. Second degree polynomial. How many zeros? In real, if you have only real uh, uh, the, the, the numbers, then you have either 0, 1, or 2, the, the, the uh, 0 points. In complex polynomials, we have always the same number of zeros for the polynomial as we have the highest polynomial degree, always like that. Meaning that mathematically, we can actually write the same same uh, 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 rational polynomial as first we have this kind of scaling factor here as a um, product of first order polynomials, meaning z minus z1 times z minus z2 times z minus z three times and so on times z two minus z n where these z's here are constant and they are the uh, uh, complex roots of this polynomial okay I know this is uh, it, this might be actually a little bit hard if you have never heard of polynomials or complex numbers, <laughs> but just just take it that is it's you or me. Uh, da, 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 da. So basically, these special points. Uh, let me we'll tidy it up a little bit. So this is same as the product from k from one to n. Uh, z to minus z k and product of k from 1 to n z to minus p k. So here the z k are the zeros of the system, p k are the poles of the system. Okay, so those are basically just the special po points on the complex plane. And that defines the behavior of the system. <laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> but, but, that, but that's the only way, basically. You just need to take this as if they are. It's like a doctor's medicine, you know. You don't understand what is on the bottle, but you take it anyways. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, at 3 o'clock, we will have a short break, so... <laughs> Unless you break before that one. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. So let's let's try to figure. It. Okay, transfer function zeros, meaning the zero. zero uh, basically, the points where the the uh, this function goes to zero. Those are the the uh, basically the uh, same as the this numerator polynomial, the the uh, zero points. Uh, then the poles are the places where this one goes to infinity. Well, divided by zero, meaning infinity. In complex plane, what, what means, well, it's somewhere. <laughs> uh, those are also special points. And now the trick is actually how to keep the signal so it doesn't hit, you know, on those, uh, the poles of the transfer function. 
Whoa, magic. Let me take a picture. Maybe this one starts to make some sense at some point. <laughs> okay, did I? Yeah, I think I have the picture of this one. Okay, so this is a complex plane, complex numbers. There's nothing complex about complex numbers. Let me draw the complex plane. We have the J axis and then we have the real axis. So this is the, well, imaginary, imaginary axis. And this is the real, real axis. Okay, uh, the signal actually, all the signals in the world reside within unit circle. Right. Well, that's that's the way they are. So this is the region of uh, where the, the signals are. Wait a minute. No, 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 no. No, no, it's something funny. I'm, I'm saying something funny here. Yes, that's... Uh, forget that one. Do I get any any sense out of this? No, I don't. <laughs> ah. Okay. Let's let's take the other approach. Uh, this is not nice unit circle. I need to draw it again. On the imaginary plane. Uh, we can actually mark the zero points and the pole points to this plane. And let's mark this one as the uh, unit circle. So that's unit circle. Okay. Unit circle is there. Uh, what else? Then we can actually present these zeros and poles in this plane. So these are just simply locations, coordinates right in here. Let's, for example, put a couple of uh, zeros there on the unit circle. They can be ac actually also somewhere else. Uh, then uh, we could add some poles, for example, let's put three poles like that. Oops. We could try to make this system for the octave then and see what happens. But anyways, uh, so those are the poles. How about if I said this one actually looks like a um, low pass filter? This actually is low pass filter. Fundamentally, a point on unit circle defines a sinusoid function. Uh, input with the uh, sinusoid with the, 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 the frequency defined by that angle. So E to J omega actually is a sinusoid signal on the angle. Okay. That angle omega there actually is defined as 2 pi, well, let's see, do, 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 sampling rate. Uh, how does it go? Yes, 2 pi times 
singular rate defined by sample rate. So the real frequency is actually directly proportional to this angle. Transfer function, just remember what it is, actually. The, we have the uh, output Z-transform is the transfer function of, of the system multiplied by uh, input there. Okay. And this is our signal. So on low frequencies, we are actually close to these poles, meaning the uh, denominator values on this region are small. Right. So this one is small. Z minus P1, for example. Huh? Z minus P1 is, uh, well, for example, that one here. That's small. It's basically just a distance with direction, so it's a difference vector. Okay, those values are small compared to the distances to zeros. So you have more gain on these uh, frequencies than here. When we are on this side of the uh, uh, this polar circle, basically at that point we have zero and the unit circle, meaning it's right there, one of those zeros, okay, that one. If we are right there with the angle, then the transfer function is zero nothing comes out. So basically, just from the looking at the zero pole plot, I can already start saying, okay, we have a amplification gain on these low frequencies and some suppression of gain on the uh, higher frequencies. So this must be a low pass filter. Just because of the distances. And thinking of okay, that complex angle here defines the physical frequency. All right. Uh, yeah that picture here is Okay, um, what else? Then the zeros and poles. For example, for the uh, four-point running average filter, you get these zeros. And you, you, do, you know already that running average actually suppresses a little bit of high-frequency noise. That's, that's why it's used. You, you, if you have no, nothing else to do with the data, you usually just calculate the average and give it <laughs> as an answer. Uh, that's one way of suppressing the noise. You just calculate averages. But anyways, so basically for four-point running average filter, you get third order polynomial. It's a highest degree polynomial. You get three zeros as well as three poles. All the poles are actually at the origo of the z-plane. So basically, when you think of the uh, this this equation here, the denominator remains one. The distance is always the same, but then you have basically that kind of uh, well, yeah, zeros and poles. The uh, the transfer function goes to zero at that frequency and that frequency. You don't need to worry about this bottom half because that that's actually zero frequency 
and here you have the uh, sampling rate over two, which is the highest frequency you will care about. This is just the same frequencies, but with a different phase. So these are basically exactly the same, just opposite phase. All right. Wow, back to the uh, fundamentals. Actually, the poles define if the system is stable or not. As long as you keep all poles inside of this unit circle, you can be sure that your system is stable. It filters. If you have any one of the poles outside of the unit circle, system is unstable, meaning that one of those poles is here, you will have a saturating system. It starts, when you get, give any um, signal in, it starts immediately going haywire and you will get not the numbers in just few cycles. Uh, a critically stable system means that there is a pole or pole pair on exactly on the unit circle. Very hard to keep it there though, because of the computing accuracy. If you have a little bit on the wrong side of the unit circle due to the machine epsilon, something like 10 to minus 16, then it starts to be unstable. Not a good thing. Um, zeros, the location of those zeros do not affect on the stability. Uh, well, you can actually think it of, of this way. Okay, uh, how to keep this one in good shape, meaning, well, these zeros actually can be anywhere. It still gives, uh, say, 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 uh, the answers within the limits. Good. Wow, that was hard stuff. <laughs> but now we have a break. And I think Hiro prepared some, yeah, yeah, there's some tea. Uh, let's wait for Hiro before taking that. But anyway, so, so thank you for tolerating this. Uh, I know this is hard stuff. Uh, this is probably was the hardest lecture during my trip. 